Okay. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I think the connection is maybe not the best here. <laughs> Can everyone hear me okay? Well, welcome to American People Presents Free Friday Webinars. I'm Shelley Sanchez Terrell, and I am coming to you today from Houston, Texas. And every Friday we are here, it's absolutely free, and you can get your certificate of attendance from American TESOL. We've done over 150 webinars, and you can find them all recorded as well, and resources, so there's a lot of information. Today we're going to talk about teaching history, and there's going to be a lot of resources, especially for teaching English language learners history. And history is one of those, um, it might be the connection, so hopefully the connection gets better. Is that any better? Okay. Um, it, a lot of times history is a great topic and subject to teach your language learners because you can do so much with it. And a lot of times what we can do with history is we can help our English language learners um, to understand it by contextualizing it. So it's very important that we get them to visualize it, to make it feel as if they are there. And that's a struggle that sometimes teachers have because if you just teach by the book, it's really difficult for your students to be able to go to experience another time period. Their time period is so different than it than all of the past. They have cell phones, they have where they can Google things, and none of this was in the past. So it's really important that we get our students, even if they're not English language learners, but they're just um, all our students to really visualize, engage with history. And there's great ways to do it. One of the ways, uh, well, first of all, a lot of these ideas come from pedagogy that deals with CLIL. Now, CLIL is when you teach content and you teach language as well. So you're not teaching language separately, but you're teaching it within the realm of history. So while you're teaching your topic, whether it be history, math, science, um, then you can also teach language within that. And there's so many different types of things that you do at CLIL. Um, and these are the four C's of CLIL, content. So you ask yourself, how can I make the history more accessible to language learners? What may they already know about the topic? Now, for language learners, they'll know a lot about different types of history because a lot of times they'll have learned that before. But it's important, especially if they're in a country that's not their native country where they grew up in, their history knowledge is going to be very different than the history that is being taught in your school. So you have to um, catch them up with the other learners. Um, the other is communication. What vocabulary will they need to use? And those are things that we put inside the lesson plan. We highlight those. We highlight the grammar structure. Are they going to use the past perfect? Are they going to use the past tense? Are they going to use the present perfect? So these are things that we need to keep in mind when we're planning our lessons, which is a little bit different when you just straight plan history. Cognition, what thinking tasks will they do? Are they going to classify? Are they going to identify? Are they going to need to memorize dates? Are they going to be able to, um, are, are they going to have to know about location, geography, uh, a different way the country was divided during that particular time history? And culture, what kind of cultural considerations can you make? And you have to make cultural considerations. Because sometimes you'll teach learners, and often they're not all from the same country. So we have to consider that different types of countries are going to have different types of ways of looking at the history. And we have to consider all the ways that we look at history. And we want to make sure we don't offend our learners. Because, for example, here we have a lot of students from in Texas that come from Mexico. And we had the Mexican War. So the way they write the Mexican War in their history books, the way they've learned, is very different than we learn in Texas. So it's important that we, we, we definitely go beyond traditional teaching. We go beyond the textbook because we need them to visualize as well. 
So CLIL supports different types of lesson planning and the use of, uh, or an instructional strategies, the use of realia. And we're not going to go through all of these, but you can have access to the slides later. And you can definitely have um, the different uh, bookmarks as well. So that way you can see all of these strategies. But realia is introducing real life objects. So for example, if I talk about water, I would bring water inside. And I would show that to the kids, and they could experience that. For you, maybe it's coins uh, from the past. Maybe you have a collection of coins. Uh, or maybe you have flags or letters from the past. Or, and, and all of these things are really great. You can find a lot of museums and stuff like that. Graphic organizers are really important. They really help um, language learners. They, they help them. Uh, c categorize the information and to store it in the right place in the brain. Um, visual aids are very important. Total physical response, foldables, multimedia, all of these role plays are great techniques for teaching history, but teaching any type of subject as well. One of my favorite things to do is not a tech thing. <laughs> I'm usually known for tech sites, but it's actually hands-on. And the hands-on learning is foldables. Foldables are where students get a piece of paper, and they make graphic organizers, basically. So you can see a few here. You see the yellow one where it's like um, they open it up, and they can see it. You can see one where it's a square, and then they open up the different tabs. And it's almost like a guessing game. Foldables, the reason they're so wonderful is because, and I'll give you, some, um, I'll give you the bookmarks afterwards of where you can find all the links to great foldables that they have on history. So there's lots of links, and I'll give that at the end. But foldables are great for language learners because it incorporates total physical response. And research has shown that total physical response, when we use a movement while we're learning, when we use the body, um, we learn better. We understand things much better, and we remember them better. So TPR is a great instructional strategy for language learners, which means that foldables are really great as well. But to get students to be creative, a lot of students are kinesthetic learners. They're hands-on learners. So it really helps them um, make sense of things. And you can have foldables in any topic. You can have it for language. You can have it for math and science. So there's, there's foldables for everything. You can help them contextualize by actually taking them on virtual trips. And Google has so many incredible virtual trips for free. So if you have Google Earth, for example, they have a lot of um, places that they have in the past. And they actually put students there. And it looks just like it did in the 1920s or 30s. So there are different ones that you can find at googleittrips.org. They even have free lesson plans for you. Um, so and it has discussion starters, links, real world references, multimedia. Sometimes it has games. It has where you can walk in and you can click on things while you're inside the world. So it's it's very. Oh, is it? I'm so sorry. The audio. Okay, so let me. Maybe if I pause, is that better? Is if I pause it, is the audio any better? I hope so. Um, but there's lots of different types. There's um, even associated with literature. So for example, you may have, um, you may have one. I, I stopped the video streaming, so maybe that helps a little bit. I don't know if the Wi-Fi here is so great. Um, but you can have it associated with literature as well. Um, but there's some trips that you can take. And it's not literature associated. One of the great places is myhistro.com, which is sort of like a, it's a free app for iDevices, but you can also use the browser. And there's different things that students can do. They can create a virtual tour with pictures, a map, timeline, and audio. So they have to click on a map to show different places. So this is great. For example, let's say that you're talking about the war, and you're talking about different wars. Then you can you can stream uh, battles. The students can talk about different battles. They can mark it on a map. Um, they can put pictures that represent that. 
um, they can also speak about it and say what happened. So it's a multimedia timeline in a way, too. History Pen is an app and a web tool. Um, with the app, it's really cool because you can be at a location and you can see uh, pictures taken from different time periods of that location. But uh, if you use the web tool, it's the same thing. The great thing about mobile learning, though, is you can actually go to those locations and you can see, especially if you're studying local history. So that's something that you may want to try and do. But if you don't have that ability, you can always use the web tool, uh, the history pin, and you can go and you can, you can see the different types of photos from that particular location. And you can have great discussions revolving around those. Another thing you can do is you can have students create timelines. There's tons of multimedia timelines out there. And the great thing about these is you can use photos from the past so they can get an idea of what that time period looked like. Time Toast is a really good one. You can click on any of the dots on Time Toast, and it'll up, it'll show what the students entered. Now, you can find this is embeddable, and it moves around, and it's multimedia. So when you have these, you can either search for timelines where um, of the past of whatever you're studying. But the better idea is to get students, because there's tons of them there that you can see. You can embed it in a wiki, in a blog, in a website. But the better thing to do is get your students to actually create them. This is what it looks like. They have another type where you can see the text view. When you look at the text view, it has the picture, it has the event in bold, it has the date, and then where the students describe what happened. This one is the history of rock and roll. Um, they have another type of view with text where it's a chart. So it's like a graphic organizer as well. So they can see everything within the timeline. They see the pictures. They see the event dates, um, a, the bold print of what that particular date meant, and then a detailed description. They can include links as well to where they find that research. So for example, they found it on Wikipedia. Yes, all of these are free tools, Alexandra. And um, so, yes, definitely. <laughs> they may have uh, where you have to pay for other features, but these are free. <laughs> Timeglider.com is really great as well. It's just it's the same type of multimedia tool. But all of these, they're embeddable. They're multimedia. You can use different types of pictures to create them, um, add more. The thing with um, these is, is, is it's a great way for students to visualize history. And it's a great way for them to get engaged and to do research. But not only are they doing research and writing, but they're listening. So you can have them add audio to it. They can add videos. A lot of times there will be videos of certain history points. You can add speeches. Um, there's so many things you can do with it. Learn with online scrapbooks. So now students can actually use something like Mixbook, mixbook.com. And this is a free tool, but it's also collaborative as well. Now, Posters no longer exist. So sorry it says that. But Mixbook is great and Glockster for this. You can even use something called Byte Slides. Um, I'm so sorry. I don't know why the sound is so terrible. Um, students describe significant events in the year with various multimedia, and they can pretend to be one of the characters in the book. So scrapbook is more like a memory book. If you think about a, a lot of times students will have it for the year, like a yearbook. Uh, this is what mixbook looks like. So they can add different pictures, stickers. They add text. So it's really, really nice. They can even do this collaboratively. So they can work in a group, and they can create this. Scholastic has a great example of this. You can take students from the past. And when you have the students from the past, you can have them, um, the students in the past actually will go and they, um, the students from the past will have um, different types of um, scrapbooks as well. Like So here you can have the scrapbook of Clotie, a slave girl. And so Clotie, you can have 
um, different things like um, you can see her scrapbook, you can take quizzes, you can see pictures, you can see arts and crafts that she did, and then you, the students can copy these arts and crafts. But it's so cool because it's exactly what students love to do today. Students love scrapbooking. They love having pictures and stickers, and they do this for the whole entire school year. They do this of their friends. So they can do this online, and they can pretend to be that character, and it really engages them with the character. Scholastic is fantastic. It has games in it and all kinds of diary entries. Here, here's one of Patience Whipple. And they have it for boys and girls. So you can have the boys study what a boy did in the past, and then you can have what a girl did in the past. So a pi you can see where they post the pictures, and then um, she talks, um, and she puts little pieces of text, which is great because it chunks the language, so it's easy for language learners to process versus a textbook with tons and tons of entries. Um, and it describes it in first person, so it engages them in the story. The other thing you may look at, Scholastic has so many great sites for teaching history. They have this wonderful one of a pilgrim girl and a Native American boy. It has audio. You can read their letters. Um, they have letter from a pilgrim. They have letter from Lampanaga. So you can see all of these letters, and it's great for the students to really see the letters and read the letters because they're working with authentic materials from the past. A lot of times students are used to email or Facebook status, so it's good for them to see a letter and see what it looked like and to think about. Uh, you can get them in discussions of, ooh, how it was so much more difficult, you know, writing letters and things like that versus um, having email today. You can talk about, okay, what would um, you do, what is difference, compare and contrast your life to this boy or girl in the past. They can even take and, and the letters and they can create their scrapbook from those pieces. And they can come up with drawings and stuff that represent it. A fantastic, one of the best resources for teaching history is primaryaccess.org. So you can make a movie. But Primary Access has all of these pictures and video clips from the past that students can use. And they have them to where they can make different types of projects with these past relics that have been scanned and added online. So for example, you have a movie maker. They can make a movie. Uh, you can see here, it's like a little bit of a cartoon. Or they can use something like this, where they make something like um, when I saw, and then it's this image. So they add images that replace the vocabulary. It's a great way for language learners to learn vocabulary and also learn about the past. So try primary access. It's free. It's fantastic. You'll love it. Another place where you can get materials from the past, and this is sort of Realia, but it's Realia online. And I think it's really important that a student see these past relics. So you can go to historybuff.com. You have an audio library. It's audio recordings from the past. They have a newspaper archive, so you can see lots of newspapers from the past in English. And the great thing about studying the newspapers in the past is that it chunks the language as well. So if it's chunking the language, then that means it's little pieces of language that the students can actually process. So. Um, there's a lot for them to see. Um, the next thing that you can do is have them do something with what they learned. So if they just read about some kind of historical event, then have them do something fun, like create comics with historical figures. This is this will help them understand the the history much better than if they were going to just read and answer questions. So when you're thinking about activities for them to do, creating timelines or creating comics engages them and motivates them more than just answering questions from a textbook. And also, the great thing about comics is it gets them to visualize what the, it gets them to visualize what is happening. They have to actually provide the scene in the background. The other thing that you can do is you can also have them, um, a lot of these places like tundu.com has where you can 
Um, Toondo.com has characters from the past, like Native Americans, Romans, um, different types of European statutes and things like that, so they can actually recreate these. Criaza has some as well. Criaza has past presidents. It has also historical figures. Sometimes you can find like Pocahontas and things like that. So you can find you can find um, a wide range of world history characters as well. GoAnimate.com is where you can create dialogues. They're they're video dialogues, and it's a free resource, and it's a video, and the, it's great for language learners. I always mention it, and one of the reasons I mention it is because it has historical figures. It has the presidents, it has um, different Roman soldiers, things like that. So what they do, your students, and it's great for language learners. It's one of the best tools there is for language learners because your students can pick different characters, they can work in pairs, which working in pairs always fosters um, them with the language. So they type in or they can actually record themselves saying a dialogue. So a good activity for this is for them to take uh, historical figures from the past and to tell them to modernize the, the, the dialogue. What would they say now? Uh, what, because language changes so much, so your students, when they're translating, when they're taking the language from the past and they're making it more present and modern, then they're able to really understand and process it more. It, it translating like that, where it's English from the past, archaic English versus the English now, shows them the difference between um, BICS, which is casual language, and then you also have um, Helps, which is which is more complicated uh, language as well. Um, Boki, Boki is another fantastic site for language learners. And the great thing about Boki is they have free lesson plans, so your students can choose different characters, and they have past characters as well, presidents and governors and um, historical figures. And there's lesson plans, so you can look up ESL as a lesson plan. And it gives you free lesson plans that you can download. You can also use different types of lesson plans um, as well um, from history. So Puppet Pals. And then they can create them. And uh, the students love creating Vokies. We've used them with uh, students as young as four years old. So, <laughs> And even my adult students, I used to use them with my adult students that were 80, you know, up to 80 years old. So they love them as well. It's kind of one of those things that you can use for language learners of all ages. Puppet Pals is really good. Unfortunately, they don't have a lot of characters in the free version. Um, but if, if If you get the paid version, you can have them draw the characters, and then they can upload it, and they can create dialogue. Motivate them to learn beyond the classroom. How can we get them to study history outside of the classroom? Homework. Well, I don't like to call it homework. I call it mission, so or a challenge. So I say, I put it in a wiki, and I say, your challenge for today is and then I give them options. And a lot of these options are games. And there are so many wonderful games on Facebook that have to do, and other places on apps as well, that are great for learning history. And the students love them. There's where you build Roman cities. There's where you um, they get to travel in ancient times and do battle. So students really love this, but get them, they're already playing these games. You can get them to pay attention to the historical uh, facts within it as well. There's a great site that I just discovered, and you can see it here, um, thanks to Peggy who's been putting in the link. But playinghistory.org, playinghistory.org, is a place where you can find history games. It'll tell you, um, you, can, you can see here it says England, battle, war, military. So you can search the China game, Chinese history. So you can find history from all over the world, and you can play a game, and it gives you different ways to play the game. It tells you the language in it. It tells you what you're going to learn within the game. That's um, a historical fact and things like that. 
So like, for example, in this one, this game is really cool. It says, um, and they have tons and tons of games. So for example, um, we have um, in argument wars, argument wars, you debate historical Supreme Court cases by advancing arguments back and forth. So it's a really great game to be able to debate and argue and learn language. Russell Tarr is fantastic. He teaches history, but Russell Tarr, um, he also, he's at Russell Tarr on Twitter. I would definitely follow him. And he makes all these cool tools because he is a programmer as well. And so he made something called Fake Tweet. And he has a, where you can take a historical character, and he has examples already, and you can make a Twitter for them. So here you can put the name of the person, you can put the real name, and then you can put tweets like they might have made in the past. They also have where you can create Facebook pages that are fake Facebook pages for historical figures. And he has a whole bunch that students can study as well. Um, students love Facebook, so they'll love Facebook. Facebook is a great resource for creating historical figures and really understanding what they're doing. Character text. You can have students get into pairs. They choose characters they want to be. They text to each other a conversation they imagine the two characters would have now. There's a great app called Vosi. Vosi will have them create voice messages. Or you can use Russell Tarr's fake SMS. He has an SMS generator. Here's an example. It's Darth Vader talking to Luke. So the students, they're building the language. They're creating language. It's something that's relevant to them that they like. But they're also understanding what they're learning. ActiveHistory.co.uk. This is where Russell has all of his stuff. So I would definitely um, look that up. Not all of the stuff on Active History is free. So make sure. Um, uh, so look at that. I think it's definitely worth paying for, though. You can find different types of history interactive. Um, this is more for travelers, but it is on um, the App Store and Google Play. So you can go anywhere and you can find calendars, you can find history videos here. Um, you can have locations where it's zoomable, and you can see different events really quick. There's a history calendar for iPad. It's absolutely free. You can um, click and you can see what happened within the day. So you can do this as a morning starter where you have your students go and each student will read something that happened that day. Now you can find tons and tons of resources if you go to um, this pearl tree. Sorry, um, the, the, all of this is kind of hard to hear. So you can follow all of these links here. And then you can also get your certificate for attending. And you can get other resources as well if you go to the bit.ly address. So sorry so much that all of this was, it was hard to hear today. I think it's, it's um, probably the internet connection. And thank you so much for attending. Have a great, great weekend.